Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode three of the Make Azure AI Real series. And in today's lesson or workshop or whatever you want to call it, conversation, I don't know, uh, we are going to be covering the almost important in top topic, making AI responsible, using AI responsibly, building with AI responsibly, all of those things. And we have probably one of the best, best people to do it. Uh, Ruth, how are you? How, how's it going? Hi, Corey. You're too kind. I'm doing good. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> Very nice. Well, Ruth, this is your first time, even though we're going to be doing something again tomorrow. But we normally start off with a bit of a random question, but not always random. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'd love to know in the audience, but I would love to ask you as well. Uh, what is the scariest movie you've ever seen? Oh, really? You're going to surprise me with a question? <laughs> yeah, this wasn't in the prep, Ruth. This oh is uh, welcome to Make Azure and I Real. We have to be as real as possible. It's all scripted. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I think for me, the Exodus tops everything. Exodus. Haven't seen it. I'm actually not. Uh, so this is a context for anyone watching this in the future. This is today's Halloween for those uh -huh. who celebrate. So we're uh -huh. trying to stay on theme here. But I'm not a big horror film person. But I say the scariest movie I've ever seen is The Ring. Um, this one? The Ring. Have you seen the that Ring? one? Oh, yeah. my God. I haven't watched that. Don't don't watch it. <laughs> I it, it, this is a uh, backstory, but I used to like if I was really scared growing up, I would uh -huh. have the TV on to go uh -huh. to sleep. Right. But in that movie, not a huge spoiler because if you've seen anything about it, a girl actually climbs out of the TV. So it kind of oh, ruined the whole. Uh, use the TV as a security blanket for me. Uh, so. So I bet now you always sleep with with the TV. You make sure the TV is off. Yeah, well, now I have to turn it off because I don't want any, like, you know, ghosts coming out of it. But let us know. <laughs> let us know in the audience if we've got a, a few people here watching on the stream. So, yeah, what's the scariest movie uh, you have seen in the audience? But second question, Ruth, for you. We always ask this for our guests. Uh, mm -hmm. What does making AI real mean to you? Making AI real? Yeah. Um, making AI real for me is um, how can we make it practical? Um, there are a lot of theories um, out there, uh, but making it real is like, okay, how can I take uh, AI and make make a difference, make an impact? So nice. I think that's kind of relevant to uh, responsible AI uh, because it seemed like for the longest time, it seemed like it was just a, maybe a slogan, principles, but at the end of the day, people are like, okay, how do we actually do this again? So mm -hmm. for me, I think once you give people practical stuff, yeah. Nice. Implement, yeah, bring it to life. Exactly. Well said. Our little motto that we have here, and I completely made it up on episode one, but it's uh, make Azure, Azure AI real. We don't talk AI. We do AI. Uh, so I like great that. answer. Yeah, great answer. And uh, speaking of answers, we got a few uh, para, uh, about the scariest movie. So Paranormal Activity, again, uh, one, I only watched the trailer. I haven't watched the full film because I'm already scared of the trailer. Like, <laughs> You know what? Even the title is scaring me. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you said that because this one doesn't seem like a scary movie. I don't know if this is like ironic answer. I've never seen or even heard of this movie. Good Morning from Seattle. Uh -huh. Rob, I don't know if that's actual scary or not or you're just playing. That doesn't but... sound it sounds welcoming. Yeah, I don't know if it's just a bad movie. That's what you mean by scary. Please, please clarify, Rob, for us. Uh, cool. So, you know what is not a scary movie, of course, is that, uh, you know, all these movies about AI taking over the world, taking, uh, you know, these things, because everyone, of course, is going to watch this workshop and watch our topic, and they're going to build responsible AI systems, and we won't have to worry about that. Uh, but before we begin and give the floor to you, Ruth, uh, mm -hmm. I just want to make a quick note. We actually uh, just launched our uh, generative AI for beginners course to, today, actually, and like an hour ago. And, and we actually do also have a responsible AI uh, lesson, which Ruth, you have graciously uh, contributed and edited my crazy writing on that topic. So I really appreciate that. Uh, that but do check good. out <laughs> that link below. Um, and you can do it. It's a 12-part uh, lesson. It's a GitHub repo completely free. So if you're looking to, we're going to talk about AI and ML activity 
almost in general, but if you're also looking to do uh, some generative AI work, uh, that's mm -hmm. the link for there. But that's enough of me going on, because like I said, we don't talk AI, we do AI. So Ruth, please tell us, how can we do AI responsibly? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll make sure not to scare you guys. On how <laughs> yeah, <to> please don't. <laughs> Make AI responsible, Blay. Um, let's see. Let me get my slide up. So um, today I'm going to be talking about um, how we can train, debug, and deploy um, mo uh, AI models responsibly using responsible AI. Um, and to do all of this, uh, we're going to be doing end-to-end uh, demo. So that's why this is a two-part uh, series. Um, so today we're going to cover how to train your model, um, how to use a responsible AI dashboard, which is a very cool user interactive interface that um, you can debug your model and you'll be blown away at the things that uh, it's able to uncover. So the good thing about uh, the responsible AI dashboard is um, you can train, debug, um, deploy your models in Azure Machine Learning. And there's also open source version as well. But today we'll focus on um, Azure Machine Learning. Nice. Yeah. So before I get into the nitty gritty of uh, responsible AI, um, let's talk about the world today. So as everyone here uh, is aware, AI innovation is occurring at a very rapid pace. Um, yeah, the it, it, innovations or breakthroughs in AI is mind blowing, especially with uh, generative AI um, and open AI, that sort of thing. Um, another thing that we're seeing is uh, a lot of companies are accelerating their adoption of AI. So it's not just uh, the uh, consumer products that uh, uh, a lot of companies are utilizing AI, but they're also using AI internally. You hear of uh, co-pilot uh, AI solutions. Um, that's to help um, enhance uh, business processes and make uh, the everyday mundane task uh, easier for uh, the workforce like the employees, um, so they can concentrate on uh, things that are more important. Another thing that is uh, we're seeing is societal expectation is also evolving. Um, I feel like in the last year or so, uh, responsible AI has been on top of mind um, in every conversation. Uh, also, uh, Everybody and their grandma is talking about AI oh, yeah. and responsible oh, yeah. uh, AI. You're like, grandma, not you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Grandma, how do you get access to ChatGPT? I don't know how you did that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, then another thing we're also seeing is um, governments um, talk, uh, talking more about AI, um, about uh, stepping in and uh, figuring out ways to regulate uh, AI in response. So the question is, uh, when we talk about responsible AI, what do we actually mean? This is perfect, uh, Ruth. Great transition because we got one uh, question from the audience already. Uh, what do we mean by responsible AI? You so. know what? I like this person. <laughs> I like this whole yes. audience. This audience, Ruth, I should have told you this, but uh, since we do AI here, people are always ready to, just to jump on it, to uh -huh. get the answer, start building. And I love like this was like the opening question. <laughs> yeah, that is an excellent question because I had the same question three years ago. It's like, okay, what is this responsible AI? Um, and you also hear of uh, ethical AI um, is it just a slogan, um, that sort of thing. But um, at least for Microsoft, when we're talking about uh, responsible AI, there are actually um, six different principles that uh, we look to practice and also um, some of our um, clients and partners have adopted. 
So number one is fairness. Uh, fairness is basically, hey, when you're building an AI solution, uh, making sure that uh, it is uh, considering um, not just one set of people, but uh, a multitude of uh, people that have similar um, attributes uh, in the use case that you're dealing with. Um, so making it fair and evenly um, used across uh, different demographics. Um, the next thing is reliability um, and safety. So when we talk about reliability, uh, we need to make sure that, okay, when we're building AI solutions, they are reliable, they are safe, and they are consistent. So it's not, okay, um, every now in this situation, um, this disclaimer, be careful, <laughs> and in another dis uh, situation, it works well, it has to be consistent. And also for developers that are um, developing um, these AI systems to ensure that um, the AI um, systems works in normal situations and abnormal situations. Um, so let's say um, you're talking about the electric car. Um, you test it all throughout the, in the daytime, but did you test it at night? Um, did you test in different weather conditions? Uh, that sort of thing. Then we have privacy and security. So with privacy and security is basically what exactly what it is. Uh, we all know getting um, data for uh, training AI models is very hard. So number one, uh, when we're dealing with data, where did we get the data? Uh, is, is it from a credible source? Can we trust that data? Um, that sort of thing. Then even within the data, um, what's in that data? Does it have uh, people's private information, PII information? Um, are we, like how are we handling that? Then with security, um, it's always, there's always, uh, uh, what's it called? A vulnerability uh, with um, somebody coming in and messing with the data, uh, similar to <clears throat> the uh, generative AI um, course that um, Corey just mentioned. One of the parts uh, that uh, he covers is also making sure when we create uh, prompts, somebody can actually jailbreak and mess with, with the rules um, and your prompts are suddenly behaving differently or grab information that they shouldn't. So um, that's another example. Another example, excuse my um, squeezing of the <laughs> screen, but it's inclusiveness. So one thing you may be thinking, well, inclusiveness, isn't that covered in fairness? Um, it does kind of overlap, but inclusiveness, um, just think of... Uh, when you're building your model, always think, okay, are there other demographics that we're missing? So perfect example is um, there are a billion people that have uh, disabilities. So when we're building AI solutions, um, we may consider that, okay, um, we are checking the checkbox um, that, okay, we're covering accessibility, but, um, some people may think accessibility, it only comes with maybe somebody who's blind or deaf, um, but there are other uh, disabilities um, that um, almost every one of us may have, like colorblindness, uh, being dyslexic. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things. Um, reading fast versus reading slow. Um, so those are different things that um, when we're building AI solution, we have to think of uh, the, make sure we're covering all the demographics. Transparency I think, is a- I think huge... there was a really good quote. Sorry to interrupt that. Uh -huh. I, I'm gonna butcher this quote, so I don't know why I'm interrupting you to even butcher the quote, but it was something like, we're all a part of an accessibility group. It just hasn't happened yet. Like, you know, as we age, how we interact with technology is going to change, right? So I think like <laughs> most people, you know, who are you know fully able-bodied and or don't think about that, you need to like think one day you will probably have something that requires you to be 
included in a system design or a product design or a user interface. So it's super important to your point to like, you know, build systems that are doing that, especially in the AI side of things. I like that example because that's totally true. Like the way some people text so fast, I'm like, is this a keyboard? And I can't even do that, even if I wanted to. Um, <clears throat> then the next part is transparency. Uh, when we're building our models, uh, we all know AI models are black box. Uh, we need to understand um, how it goes about to make predictions. When something goes wrong, we need to know exactly what caused it to be wrong. And it's not just how the AI is performing, uh, it's also when we're deploying our AI systems. We also need to disclose, uh, okay, what uh, in what situations should we use this model? Uh, in what situations does this model not work, work too well? So disclosing all of that information to the general public also brings uh, trust. And also when there's um, regulatory things uh, when you're being audited. Uh, transparency is also an area that uh, is heavily involved. The accountability, as we're building all these solutions, we need to be accountable for what we build, uh, whether something is uh, goes good or bad. I, I think that's a great point. Uh, this is kind of a funny one. Uh, wrote, uh, it wasn't me, it was the AI shagging. But like, that is a really, play on the things like, right? Some people like to blame the model or blame the AI for generating something, but obviously it's us that needs to be accountable, whoever has built the model, deployed the model in, in such a fashion. So you can't say it just wasn't me and, and run away. <laughs> yeah. I like the comment, thank you, John. <laughs> yeah, I like that it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the question is, um, well, we've already been debugging our models when we train it. So let's say we have classification, um, a classification model, we have all these um, performance metrics that we're looking at. Um, and when you have a regression uh, model, you also have other metrics. So um, if we already are checking performance, um, why do we need to debug any further? So the question I'll ask um, us, the audience, and you and I is, let's say you have a model that is 93% accurate. Um, the question is, what's going on with the 7% um, that the model does not perform so well? Um, what demographic does that fall in? Because if that could be a crucial uh, demographic that um, you're actually overlooking. And all of these metrics that we're looking at, how do we know how to catch any, let's say, data biases? How do we know how to catch any security issues? Um, how do we prove transparency and whatnot? So as you can see, um, we need these uh, metrics, but we need to go a lot deeper into the data and the behavior of the model to truly understand how it is working and where the issues are. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the exciting things uh, that um, uh, we have is uh, the Responsible AI Dashboard. Um, and this is um, actually uh, a collaborative uh, solution. Um, this is something that uh, Microsoft has uh, uh, contributed to. A lot of um, companies out there, kind of like uh, FairLearn, InterpretML, uh, AeroAnalysis.ai, and a lot of uh, research uh, institutions have also uh, come up with solutions to debug AI solution because we, the data science community understands that this is a serious, crucial area, and this is actually something that data scientists actually want and need. Um, problem is there are no tools out there um, to uh, help 
uh, the uh, debug uh, their AI models. And it's not like uh, when we hear about responsible AI, nobody wants their model to be uh, responsible or nobody even wants their model to uh, maybe be exclusive. So the good thing about this dashboard is all of those different uh, technologies that all of these institutions have put together, they do one uh, single thing separately. So even if you're to in, uh, invoke it in your Python code to debug, when you do that, um, you need to bring in another library and do a, other analysis and whatnot. So it's hard to really uh, merge everything together to get the big holistic picture. So what this dashboard does is it puts everything all in one. So you can see how things are going. So the very first part is uh, error analysis. So error analysis is just identifying, even if uh, your model says ah, it's 99% accurate, um, using error analysis, it's able to find areas where your model is not performing well, which uh, data in your demo data demographic is not performing well. Also, Data Explorer, uh, it looks at your data representation. Do you have over-representation or under-representation? That's where a lot of biases come from. Then Model Overview, um, using the same traditional metrics that we have. Um, fairness Assessment, uh, Model Interpretability, that's uh, like explaining uh, how the model is behaving, counterfactuals, and what if. That's when, because it's good to see how the model is performing, but you also want to test, if I change this in the data, if I change this my data a little bit, how is my model going to behave? So those are good ways to um, test how your model is going to be behaving especially in uh, situations that may not be normal, um, that sort of thing. But with um, this, you will be able to do those uh, type of debugging. So um, I'll say all of this is uh, things that uh, engineers would do on a day-to-day -day basis. Then on the business decision side, um, it's uh, a lot of business uh, stakeholders will utilize even the what if analysis to make decisions and also causal analysis. So if they're planning to roll out uh, changes uh, before they roll out, uh, they can do uh, analysis, almost like A-B testing, but you're not um, spending the money or allocating the resource. You can test things out before rolling out a business strategy um, to see how the let's say consumers or your users are gonna respond to it. So <clears throat> very quickly. I just wanna say, I really liked your point about uh, no one like kind of intentionally goes out and you know builds an irresponsible model. Like no one's going to like the irresponsible, like irresponsible models workshop that we had yesterday. You know, it's like, so, <laughs> it, but we're you know, building the tools and things like that to make re responsibility much easier to achieve. Uh, which I think that's a really good point um, to get across to everyone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because it actually, uh, especially if you're a business, it kind of, it can affect your reputation too, so. For sure. Okay, so I think I have uh, three more slides, then we'll get to the coding. Um, so when I was, uh, just to give you guys a little bit uh, visualization into what I'm talking about, uh, <clears throat> this is a normal way that we train our model. We train our model. We do the uh, analysis, performance analysis with, with the traditional uh, machine learning metrics. And it will show us uh, accuracy, like, okay, this model is 89% accurate. We're like, yay, finally. But realistically, this is how your model looks. Um, there's a demographic, um, let's say the one in red, you don't know that this demographic is only 40% accurate. Um, this one is only 59% accurate. This one 
the model is only uh, uh, accurate uh, 79% of the time. So that's the reason why it's good to use uh, a debugging tool. Um, so this is a snapshot of the dashboard, um, one of the um, sections of the dashboard. So um, this is how it, analyze, it um, analyzes your model. And the red hot red spots are the uh, areas where there are issues. So the darker the red, the higher the error rate. <clears throat> Another thing I talked about is um, data representation. So I think this image is um, a pretty good one. So imagine you have a whole, this is all your data set. There's, um, there's some demographics uh, in this um, big circle over here. Um, that's a representation of some of your data. And some demographics fall in this little data. So as you can see, there's an imbalance in your data representation. So guess what? When you train your model, your model is probably going to be more favorable to the popular uh, demographic the demographic that falls into the bigger ball. And the ones that are underrepresented, guess what? Um, your model is not gonna be favorable. So the good thing that this um, dashboard does is you'll be able to um, analyze your data um, and see um, how the model is behaving. Um, with certain demographics, like uh, and looking at uh, the data distribution um, of its behavior and knowing that, okay, um, the model is favoring this demographic versus that demographic. So we can go to the final slide. So <clears throat> the last uh, part is kind of like how I mentioned, um, AI models tend to be a black box, so um, it's hard to uh, really explain um, how um, it's going about making its uh, predictions. So what the dashboard uh, actually does is it, make a, it makes it like a glass box. So it's, you can see and understand exactly what is going on. So um, one of the features is, uh, let's say you have a whole bunch of features. Um, these are the data sets uh, that you have. Um, you have the ability to, on a global level to see, okay, what are the top 10 features that uh, the model is, uh, uh, that are driving the model's prediction? So what are the top, uh, I'll say five, uh, features that are influencing the model's uh, prediction, you'll be able to see this. So let's say this is like a loan uh, application model, and you see that, okay, the top five driving factors that uh, the model uh, takes into consideration to approve or deny somebody's um, loan is their gender and their race. So if you see that, okay, maybe like one of those uh, sensitive features, uh, one of the top features, automatically you're going to know that, okay, this model is not behaving the way it should be because it is uh, uh, basing its uh, predictions on a bias uh, feature. Another good thing is even though you see these uh, top uh, five or top 10 features. When you look on um, the dashboard, it gives you the ability to also go drill down on the individual level and be able to identify exactly for this individual what made, let's say, the model reject their um, loan versus another uh, individual that has the same characteristics. So, um, maybe the top uh, 10 or top five criteria are not always gonna be the same as this global one because each individual is different. So um, each individual is, uh, the way the model is uh, making its predictions uh, different. So you'll be able to deep dive. 
And this really comes in handy uh, if you're being audited. Um, so I use financial services, but let's say you're in healthcare and you're using uh, AI to make um, diagnosis uh, and you get audited. Uh, okay, what were the driving uh, features that made you diagnose this patient to have this or that? Um, so <clears throat> we can uh, go to the code. Let's do so it. I'm bringing up the code. <laughs> do you have any questions? Yeah, let us know if you have any questions. We just dropped the link there in the uh, in the chat as well as on mm -hmm. below. I can't. If I point down, I'm just pointing to you, so that's not official. Ruth, can you point down to the link so that everyone knows that that's the link? Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, there we go. Yeah, I mean, yeah there we go. That's the link. Uh, so I know it's probably hard to see on the maybe on the slide there, but there's a big link there. Uh, so we will should walk through uh, this repo. But this is uh, we always get this question when we do these: like, is this being recorded or is this recorded? So the answer is yes. This goes live again on the Reactor YouTube channel. Uh, so you don't have to necessarily follow along now. Like, don't get stressed. Uh, you can obviously watch this back again uh, as you walk through this uh, demo. But that's where the repo is in the code. I see your screen is now up, Ruth. So we're getting started. OK, awesome. So what I'm going to do is um, show you guys, because I'm sure you're wondering, OK, I have my model, but how do I get my model from point A to hero? Like, how do I get however way I went about uh, training my model, how can I get it uh, to the dashboard? So the very first um, um, script we're gonna run, all it's doing is, is grabbing data and training um, a classification model. So while I'm explaining, we can have this running. So the data that we're using is uh, data from uh, UIC, University of California, uh, I think Irvine. Um, and basically is uh, data about uh, diabetes uh, patients. So what the classification model, what it's trying to do is predict if a, a patient is discharged from the hospital, what, is, what are the chances of them being readmitted back to the hospital within 30 days? So after we train this model, it's predicting, okay, this uh, patient is gonna be readmitted um, back uh, maybe after 30 days or uh, not, or they're going to be readmitted within 30 days, which is not good. So the very first thing that we're doing is um, um, calling, <clears throat> reading the input data uh, that we're already split into training and test data and save in the parquet file. Um, so if you guys notice, um, we're um, extracting the target field. So there's an app attribute called, um, or a feature called readmit status. And that's the status that says yes or no, somebody's gonna be readmitted in uh, within 30 days. Um, later on, you see how this is important because since this is a classification, we need to tell uh, the dashboard, um, what field we're trying to decide on. Then the risk is uh, pretty straightforward. We're getting our training and test data. Um, then um, normalizing uh, the data. So we're doing our encoding. Since we have a very mixed audience, can you tell us a little bit about why do we normalize data? Um, so your data can come into different forms. Um, it can come into text. It can come into uh, large numbers, small numbers. So, you know, when you're training your model, you want it to be in a certain range that um, your model understands. Um, so that's why uh, you need to, and it also needs to know, okay, this is numerical, this is categorical, uh, a string, that sort of thing. So those are some of the things that are as good to 
um, normalize your data uh, when you're training it, and it helps uh, the training process go faster as well. Um, so these are the pre-processing um, step. We're um, doing the encoding, um, and we're putting it, it into uh, a pipeline. So each time we, um, and we're using a logistic uh, regression. So each time we try to uh, train the model, it already has all of these uh, encoding steps. Um, and it will just run the preprocessor whenever we need to train additional data. So um, after training the model, uh, we can see that, oh, uh, for this classification model, um, the accuracy score is uh, 0.839, uh, which is pretty good. It's almost like the slide. Um, so the next thing is um, the Azure Machine Learning comes with the SDK. Um, as you can see, I'm running this uh, from my desktop. So the good thing is um, you can um, install this, uh, the SDK for Python, and it uses uh, the ML client. So if you need to authenticate into your Azure ML workspace, um, this is how to go about authenticating. Um, it, use, it basically um, depends on a config.json um, file, which um, when you're running it um, yourself, um, you need to copy from the Azure Machine Learning Workspace. Um, you download it, and it has three fields in there, your subscription um, ID, your Azure resource uh, name and uh, resource group and uh, the Azure machine learning uh, workspace that you created. So all it is doing is connecting to that workspace um, in the cloud. The next thing that um, the Azure machine learning studio also does, it puts everything, organizes everything for you. So you just read your data. Um, it has uh, a data uh, function. And basically, what it does is uh, it takes your data and stores it into a data set. The good thing about that is, let's say you're working on a team, and um, you all need the centralized data to do run different experiments. Good thing is the data is cleansed, it's in one place. You guys don't have to move the data around each time somebody needs to run a different um, experiment or training with it. Um, all you can do is um, point, um, use the pointer uh, to where this um, data set is stored. So that's uh, very useful. Um, the next thing is we're um, creating a compute uh, cluster. Um, that we're actually going to be using to run our training model. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, spinning up a VM uh, instance. Um, the next thing that um, Azure has is something called jobs. So jobs are very handy um, because as we're um, training our models, we usually do multiple things. So say you grab the data, um, you cleanse it. Next thing is, okay, you have to do the pre-processing steps, um, encode it, then train it, and all of that. So the good thing about um, creating a job is you can have a pipeline, a job pipeline, and each task is a component. So the data cleansing part is a component. Um, the training part is a component the deployment part is component. So uh, for this one, um, since we have the data uh, already saved, uh, what we're doing is declaring what the experiment is, um, also specifying what the compute is, um, also specifying, OK, where is the data located? What type of uh, data uh, are we passing? So we're um, passing a URL uh, or a URI uh, 
path, um, where's the source code located? Like uh, when we train that uh, model, where are we gonna store it? Uh, then you also have, you have the option of um, creating your own environment or Azure also creates uh, curated environments. Um, it's just uh, whatever uh, dependencies that you need, you can put it in the environment. Then uh, what we're doing here is executing the command to actually um, take the Python train, training code uh, with our training data, um, the target field that we're using for classification and also the output that we want where we want that model to be saved. <clears throat> so once we have that, um, you have the client, um, you have the job, um, so you submit the job um, to actually um, train the model. Um, so this would take a few minutes, but while we're waiting, let me see if we can see the activity on the dashboard. Okay, so when it's running, um, these it's actually creating different artifacts um, in your, as you're training. So you can actually monitor um, the progress of the, the run. So the good thing is it just uh, finished training then the next thing we need to do is register um, the model because, okay, we're satisfied with this model. So we need to register it in the Azure um, Machine Learning Studio. So each time we need to communicate with the Machine Learning Studio, we're using this ML client, uh, then specifying, okay, this time dealing with the model, um, and these are the things that um, in order to store the model, you need to pass in. So the name, the path, um, and also um, use MLflow um, attributes as well. So uh, we're basically creating the model. So that's um, done. So everything that we just did here um, really is not that different from what you do, uh, because you can easily um, train your model. And once you have your model, you can just uh, take it and just uh, register it into the Azure Machine Learning Studio. And that would be good as well. But this one is a more structured, organized way of um, um, dealing with your model. So the next thing is, because this is a big question that a lot of people have. I have my model, how can I get it to the dashboard? So now we do have a model. The next thing question is, how can I get, um, create the responsible AI dashboard? And how can I utilize um, the dashboard to debug uh, my model? So similar thing, um, you authenticate, um, to the Azure Machine Learning Studio. So we've done that before. You have the model name. Um, so we're dealing with hospital um, readmission. So we give it the name. Um, we also are getting, remember we, the other um, time we called um, the ML client with models, we were actually creating now we're actually retrieving that model back. Um, so we retrieve the model. The next thing that um, the dashboard needs to do is figure out that, okay, out of all your data sets, I want to know which ones are categorical, which ones are strains. Um, so basically this function, all it's doing is going through your data set and figuring out uh, which fields are numeric and which ones are categorical, which are strings and um, identify those fields. Um, so that's pretty standard. This is the part that we're actually uh, starting to um, define our dashboard. So the very first thing you need to do is the 
dashboard comes in different sections. So you can pick and choose uh, which sections you want uh, to be included or excluded from the model. Um, it comes with a component. Um, and remember I mentioned component are one task. It does one task. So it'll create one module of, thing, of something. So we have a component um, for the construction constructor. Uh, we also have uh, a component for explanation. That's explainability. So you're basically telling the dashboard that I want to be able to use the expl explainability um, section of the dashboard to debug my model. Um, the next component is uh, error analysis. So you also want to do um, error analysis. Um, then um, gathering insights is something that uh, it also does, uh, especially for the uh, model overview. So these are the key components that you need to specify that um, you want to be included in uh, the dashboard. So once you get those, because mind you, all of these components are already pre-created within the studio. You're just uh, retrieving those uh, components. So you don't need to write any code to um, actually build that individual component. Okay. Cool. So we're coming up on the hour mark, Ruth. I know we have uh, tomorrow as well. We're going to uh, continue on here. So I don't know if this is stop and then uh, encourage everyone to join us tomorrow. The link is below Ruth. I can't get to the pointing. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I have. Then. Can I? I have two more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So the last part is actually. Um, the you need to build a pipeline. So the pipeline is what uh, is going to build your dashboard. So basically, you're passing in the the column that you're classifying. Your input uh, are the data. Um, this is um, defining uh, what the um, dashboard is about. So remember each of the different insights, the components that um, you selected. Um, these are just uh, different uh, um, parameters that you need to uh, specify. So um, you need to tell it that as a classification what type of uh, model it is. Um, you give it a unique name, then you know you pass in the model, the data set, the target field. Uh, then the rest of the fields are pretty standard. Um, so you're just passing them. And um, all you did was uh, define what your dashboard is. Um, you submit it into the data pipeline. So this is a job to actually create um, the dashboard. Um, then you're also retrieving um, um, some of the metadata, um, like uh, the UI UX uh, metadata to also be included in the dashboard. So that is it. Um, also, one thing to point out is as your model is running, um, you can also pull up uh, the pipeline and look at uh, the progress of the model. So everything that we're talking about components pipeline, visually you see exactly what is going on. So that concludes um, today's session. Uh, we learned about training your model. Uh, we learned about uh, creating the dashboard. So configuring the dashboard with the test data, your model and the target field if you're dealing with uh, the classification model. So tomorrow we'll actually go into details of uh, going through the dashboard and actually using all the different fields to debug your model. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Ruth. Everyone in the chat looks like they appreciate it. There's a, oh, I, uh, we had a little uh, snafu there. But they say thank you in the chat if you see it. Uh, and yeah, we have a, a little cliffhanger. So uh, see you tomorrow uh, where we continue on building responsible AI and like I said, we don't.
we're talking AI, we're doing AI, and we're doing AI re responsibly. So thanks everyone for joining. You could have been anywhere on the internet right now, but you spent an hour with us. So for that, I'm truly appreciative. And thank you, Ruth. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.